Hi, I'm Peter Hinson, the author of The Day After Tomorrow. I wanted to spend some time to talk about um, the geopolitics of the network economy that we're seeing playing out. For the last 10 years, we've seen the rise of network platforms in Silicon Valley, where players like Google and Facebook and on the West Coast, Amazon have become global players. Um, but at the same time in China, we've seen the rise of what they call the Batman, the Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu on search, Alibaba on commerce, and Tencent actually providing the operating system of China at this moment. And what is interesting is that these global players have actually started to evolve. And because of the network effects, we're seeing the rise of what we call category kings. It's the winner takes all of the 21st century. Google, for example, is extremely dominant in almost every market that is active. In China, where it's not active, we see that basically Baidu has an absolute monopoly on search. So in the 20th century, in many sectors, we had many big car companies, we had many big oil companies. But in the digital network economy, we're seeing that it's a winner takes all. In a market where Google is active, Google is dominant. In a market where Baidu is active, Baidu is really dominant. So these category kings are actually at this moment becoming real monopolies. But they're playing out in different geographies. Today, people are saying, well, China is China. That's where you have Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. And in the rest of the world, you have Google. But this might change. Recently, I've been spending a lot of time in China where you see the New Silk Road initiative really taking root. It's called the One Belt, One Road, where China is expanding massively its ecosystem of countries that are partnering up to really make it into a much more cohesive economic activity. And of course, that's an enormous opportunity for the Baidus, the Alibabas, and the Tencents to actually expand beyond the Great Firewall of China. This is going to mean that many of these countries involved in the New Silk Road are going to be probably dominantly occupied by these Chinese powerhouses of the digital economy. And it's almost becoming like a two-sided environment. Half of the world is the Google, Amazon, and Facebook, and the other half of the world is Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. And what is very strange is that Europe plays no role at all in this. There are no European economic players in the digital economy. And why is that? I think there are primarily five reasons. If you look at Europe today, one, there is um, a clear established issue of economy of scale. China has a home market, one home market of more than 1 billion people. The US has one home market of more than 300 million people with the same language, the same culture. Europe doesn't have that. The second issue that we see is that there is a huge difference in entrepreneurial culture. The idea of the American dream has fostered the enormous amount of startup activity in Silicon Valley. At the same time, we see the Chinese economy who is realizing that they are there to reclaim their natural role in the global economy. But the risk avoidance of many startups in Europe means that you know, we have a less chance of really becoming an absolute powerhouse. The third is money and capital where you see that Silicon Valley has been the archetypical environment of venture capital. We see that Europe has had a serious problem of funding startups in an adequate way. There's enough money in Europe, but the biggest problem is that most of the startups are chronically underfunded. They have seed capital and series A's that are significantly lower than what you see in Silicon Valley. And what is interesting now is that in the Chinese economy, the startup economy in China, we see a massive amount of venture capital flowing into very promising startups, often around the campuses and ecosystem of Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. And again, we see that US and China are funding an enormous amount of money in venture capital, whereas the European scene is chronically underfunded. The fourth element is education. We see that both in the Chinese economy and the US, there's an enormous focus to select really the elite students. The SAT system that we have in the US is making sure that only the best students get to the best schools. And that's why the Stanford's and the Berkeley's and the MIT's are actually powerhouses of startup innovation. But in China, we see an equally focus on selecting the best and the brightest. The Chinese economy has the one child policy until recently, but most families have one child and the one child has one chance to make it. On the 6th, 7th, and June of each year, the students have the massive exams that get them into the best schools, and that's where the elite students are being trained, and those are the ones who actually make the difference. In Europe, we have none of that. And the last element is really strange, it's the military. 
there is an enormous correlation in the US between the military intelligence, the military technology, and the funding of startup activities. Silicon Valley was founded on the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, the DARPA, that is still actually fueling an enormous amount of activity in Silicon Valley. And at the same time, we see in China that the government and also the military is heavily involved in promoting this next generation of technology. In Europe, we've had 70 years of peace, but actually 70 years of very little progress and maybe the lack of a coherent military strategy is one of those factors. These five elements are, in my opinion, something we have to take very seriously in Europe. If we want to understand how we as Europe can still play a role in a geopolitical digital scene where the network effects are basically positioning two huge blocks and with Europe in the middle, we've got to figure out what we're going to do to still be relevant as Europe in the day after tomorrow.